Hello, this is Maj Swaydan from Geo Investing with another case study. Uh, this is actually our second case study we are bringing to you. Our first one was on RAND Worldwide on the OTC, ticker symbol RWWI. And this is something we decided to do because we've been around 15 years trying to look for multi-baggers and we've had over 200 of them. So we thought it'd be a great idea to start you know, bringing these case studies to help us all maybe get better at finding these case studies and helping us all recognize them together. Um, because a lot of these um, traits kind of do repeat themselves, and these case studies will help us put that in perspective. Uh, this one is on IEC Electronics, traded on the NASDAQ under, under particular symbol IEC. The reason I say traded because the company eventually got acquired. Um, the stock at, at its high hit 155%. Um, and this is a classic case study of betting on a jockey, betting on management. Before we get into it, let's get just you know recognize that we have it. You know to go over our disclaimer here. We're not investment advisors. Um, you know by uh, viewing this video or listening to it, maybe even reading a transcript, you agree to the terms and conditions um, that are part of this disclaimer. And you can definitely read more about the disclaimer in full at geoinvesting.com. So let's take a quick look at the IEC coverage history at Geo. I wanted to show this chart because. It kind of gives you an idea um, how interactive we are with our subscription uh, subscribers at Geo Investing. Um, you know, we're very, uh, we really get into a story in the very beginning, and then we, you know, we definitely kind of bring that story to our members quickly, and we take it through the whole research process, even if we don't love the stock in the beginning, and we just start looking at it. This is a, a you know, a, a classic case of that. The stock IEC kind of came into our crosshairs in. June of 18, and we started covering the company around $6 a share. And actually in 2019, um, you know, a year later, is when we actually first added the stock to one of our kind of research pieces and that we call reasons for tracking. Reasons for tracking is basically a summarization maybe of the most important points of a story that we're looking at. Um, maybe not a full article, but really the, the important points to help our subscribers see kind of what we're thinking and how we're kind of trying to understand the company. And um, then in, in November, 2019, we added the stock to one of our model portfolios. You know, at Geo Investing, we cover over 1,500 stocks. So we try and make it easier for our, our subscribers to understand what are some of our higher convictions uh, stocks that we like by kind of grouping them in certain model portfolios. And we put this one in what we call our select long uh, model portfolio. Uh, then in June 2020, we actually pitched the event at uh, Fred Rockwell um, virtual event. And then in 2021, August, the company agreed to be acquired uh, by Creation Technology at a stock uh, price of $15, which was off the high of 18, but still a, a decent um, buyout. So let's get into this. Again, here's a timeline here again, uh, which you can see in bullet point format. Um, it's worth kind of getting into the percentages here a little bit. Um, at the uh, buyer price, that was a 96% gain from when we actually added the stock to our uh, model portfolio. Uh, the peak return uh, was 130% during that time span. And then the the, the peak return were actually, uh, was 155% from when we first actually started profiling the stock on Geo Investing. Um, during that period of time, we began coverage, annual revenue grew uh, over 70%, and net income increased over 300%. So in terms of um, the, the keys to success for this for this uh, IEC, um, we'll, let's go over an outline real quick. Just like RAM Worldwide, the, the, the first case that we did, this has the uh, big cap micro theme, or I can call it the big cap micro cap theme. These are companies with substantial revenue, trading as a micro cap. Um, another theme over here, as I said earlier, was the betting on the jockey. And then there's some key multi-bagger trades we want to discuss for them. Operating leverage uh, was again, and that was also an RWWI, um, early stage of a March expansion cycle, similar to RWWI. Um, a shift to a recurring revenue model or a stickier kind of model is one of the trades we look for. In this case, it was a stickier model. and um, Examining market trends as it plays into a company's strength. We look for certain unique uh, things that a company's doing within its industry to kind of give it a uh, really um, uh, competitive advantage. And sometimes um, that can lead to 
uh, multi-bagger opportunities. So again, if we, let's start off with the, with the big cap micro. And um, again, companies generating significant revenue trading as micro caps. Um, to give you an example of that space again, um, as we did with RWWI, it's worth stressing again. There's plenty of large businesses hiding um, in the stock market with smaller capitalizations. Um, just because a company has a, a small capitalization doesn't mean it's a small company necessarily. Um, out of roughly 4,500 U.S. microcap stocks, 961 have annual revenues larger than 50 million. Um, 653 have revenues larger than 100 million. 355 larger than 250 million. And 175 of these uh, stocks have revenue larger than 500 million. See, there's plenty of opportunity to find some really nice stocks um, that actually have a, a, a nice history um, as, as opposed to maybe some earlier kind of development states type of nano caps and micro caps that uh, a lot of these companies are associated with, at least um, at least stereotyped. Now, if we look at um, IC here, that's a classic big cap micro. Um, this is this company. I'll just read you what they do. They're a premier provider of electronic manufacturing services. EMS uh, is, the, is, the, is the, the abbreviation for that. To advance technology companies that produce life-saving and mission critical products for the medical, industrial, aerospace, and defense sectors. Um, we specialize in delivering technical solutions for this custom manufacturing, product configuration, and verification testing of highly engineered complex products that require a sophisticated level of manufacturing to ensure quality of, and performance. So this, um, and if we look at what the definition of an EMS is, um, companies that design, assemble, produce, and test electronic components and printed circuit boards, uh, assemblies for original equipment manufacturers, um, EMS companies may be contracted at various points in the manufacturing process. I want you to remember this though, companies that design, assemble, produce, and test. We're gonna come back to that in a second. So as you can see, this is a you know, legitimate company here. Um, you know, they've been around for over 50 years, uh, public since 2002, um, 867 full-time employees, real revenues, real profits. And they had over 200 million in revenue by the time they got acquired. Um, and um, annual earnings were approaching $10 million. So this proves again that this is a, a buyer cap company with real revenues, real profits, you know, and real, a real business here. So if we look here on, on betting on a jockey. So before we get into the multi bagger trades, let's learn a little bit about you know, the uh, CEO here. So Jeffrey uh, Schlarbaum uh, was the CEO of this company when they got acquired. Interestingly, um, he used to be with the company um, prior to his rearrival, which we'll get, we'll get back in a, get that in a second. He was with the company from 2004 to 2013, and he was not the CEO at that time, but he was definitely C-suite. Um, you know, IEC experienced several years of consistent growth. Sales rose from 19.1 million to 145 million. They were profitable from 200, 2006 to 200, 2013. The stock actually went from one dollar to to peak of eight dollars in two thousand eleven. So we had a pretty good run there, um, but eventually he resigned. He wanted to actually um, he had goals to become a CEO of the company, and I think that was kind of what was promised to him at some point if he achieved his his objectives, which he did. And um, I guess at one point they had a disagreement with the direction manager wanted to take the company and in which way he wanted to take the company, and. Um, uh, so he actually just decided to leave. Uh, and, and during that time, and on the, the new management, uh, the company made some several missteps, some failed acquisitions, and they lost kind of a, a key customer segment focus, which means they were just not really focusing on the right segments uh, to kind of have a predictable revenue stream. Because this this EMS industry can be very hard to predict and very and very um very choppy if um, if you're not really targeting the right industries. Uh, they ended up losing money in 2014 and 15. Shares uh, went from $6 to a low of $3 in 2013. So then in 2015, you know, Jerry came back to the rescue. Uh, I'm sorry, Jeffrey comes back to the rescue. Um, you know, this is one of the things I like. I, I sometimes I like this. I, you see this sometimes, not all the time, but you'll see a, 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 um, uh, a situation where a, a company, an individual used to be with a company, then comes back to save the day. 
And I like looking for those kind of markers. And this was one of them, especially because he had a history of you know success with the com company um, in the past. So we had a litmus test to go back and check that out. Um, so in, in February 2015, he was appointed as CEO. And he began to Im implement a similar strategy that he did when he was with the company before to help the company start growing. Um, sales grew from 127 million to, to, to a nearly 200 million run rate before they got acquired. Um, and they were profitable since 2016 with growth inflecting in 2017. Here is a uh, basically a copy from the presentation I put in here to show how the uh, uh, the, the backlog increased uh, for, uh, from 54 million in 2016 September all the way to uh, 212 million I think here in uh, um, uh, 2019. And what's interesting here, you can see he's getting this chart over here shows how how well he was actually getting new customers to come in uh, uh, on board. And that's we're going to come back to that in a second, because that's part of the multi-bagger traits we're going to look at. So if we look at our multi-bagger traits, we know we have eight here. There's definitely many more that we look at, but these are some of the key ones we like to stress. Um, over time, you'll probably see this, this slide getting bigger and bigger. Um, but the ones in the red are the kind of the ones that uh, IEC kind of um, met when we were following the company. A strong operating leverage, which is a very common one. Um, we, getting, we got the stock early, in the early stage of a margin expansion cycle. Um, the, the company was shifting to a more of a, I wouldn't say re recurring revenue model because that's not an EMS kind of trait, but more of a stickier model of revenue. And um, there were certain trends that the company was kind of, their strengths played in the trends that were going on in the market. We're going to get into each one of these next. So we have a look at operating leverage really quick. Um, this is when you have situations where your earn earnings grow faster than revenues or your expenses on, on the operating um, expense line uh, grow at a, or increase or at a, a slower pace than revenue, maybe go down or stay flat as revenues are going up. Something you need to keep in mind though, and I always like to point this out, is that that's great when your revenues are going up, but if revenues are going down and your expenses are not falling with revenue, that's not good too. That's just that's the flip side of operating leverage. You should understand that. But um, so revenues were up 70% between 2018 and 21, our coverage period, uh, while that income increased over 300%. So that's a classic case of um, operating leverage. If we look at the you know multi bagger trade early stage of a margin expansion cycle, you can see gross margins went from 9.7% to 13.5% between 2018 and 21, our coverage period and pre-tax margins increased from 1.3% to 5.3%. Now, this is an interesting slide because these aren't great margins, right? I mean, but it just shows you that um, that you can still have great, you know, great success in your, um, growing your net income if you're growing your margins even from a lower base and, you, and, and to, a, uh, to a higher base, even if they're still, the margins are still low. And what's cool about this, you know, even though they got acquired eventually in 2021, uh, the company had um, goals, to, I think, to get gross margins closer to even 18%. Even so they weren't even at their high end of where they wanted to get to. So that would have been interesting to see if they would have remained public, if they would have got there. But these are some of the best times to get a company when their margins don't look great. They're, they're still tiny. But you can have this long runway of many years of margin growth and earnings growth, um, and to maybe when they get to above average margins. So um, it's really when you when you have to you have to look at the industry. Sometimes you're you're, you're looking at and maybe that they, they won't have high high margins. But if a company is selling well uh, or uh, the margins are well below the industry growth uh, industry rate uh, of, of margins, um, it has a way to go to get there you can still get nice kind of uh, uh, performance and revenue uh, and in, in your in your profitability um, as as they kind of progress towards meeting those higher end margins. Uh, Multi-bagger trade is shifting to a recurring or a stickier revenue model. In this case, what what um, you know the CEO did was he he wanted to exit these cyclical markets that the old mansion had gotten into. And really, kind of, kind of target more mission critical type of uh, areas um, that were kind of revenue that would have to, would would grow through you know tough times and were necessary 
and didn't really depend upon the economy as much. So uh, these are you know medical, aerospace, defense, um, and some certain areas of the industrial you know uh, segment, semiconductor, asset tracking, transportation. I wouldn't say that that area was is necessarily not cyclical, but um, they were still targeting certain customers in these areas that um, didn't have as much kind of um, volatility in, in their demand cycles. Then if you look over here, multi-packet trade, examining market trends as it plays into a company's strength. So that's, you know, we're always looking for interesting things going on in industries that might favorably affect the company or negatively if we're, you know, we were, if we own a stock and we, we're not sure we want to own it anymore and we see things going the other way. But in this case, what was pretty cool was um, IEC was building, had this one-stop shop for customers um, and they were, their manufacturing facilities were in the U.S., so if you remember during that time, that we, we were starting to get into a situation where between, uh, you know, after 2018 or so, where there was more of this global kind of protectionism kind of uh, attitude that nations were having, you know, bringing the manufacturing home, um, doing a little bit less uh, outsourcing, uh, offshore outsourcing. Uh, so basically, uh, this this fit perfectly what IEC did, like right fell on the right in their lap. Um, and... So we saw that industry trend is something that was going to be good for them. So, and not only that, they were also a one-stop shop where, as you remember earlier, when we described the EMS, um, what that was, design, assemble, produce, and test. They just, they, did, they have the whole kind of chain there. So it's, it's a situation where they're manufacturing in the U.S., a one-stop shop, and um, which means that they can, you know, give their customers more reliability uh, the customers can trust them more and they can just uh, re react a lot quicker than um, a situation where um, a company, a, a, a EMS manufacturer only does one of these particular areas or a couple of them. And so that's, was really cool too. It's not that we don't like outsourcing. It depends, you know, some, some situations, you know, you know sometimes you got to base stay in your lane and do what you do best. But in this case, uh, they did all these things really well, and it was really an asset at the right time. Especially at that time, you had kind of supply chain. This is before COVID, obviously, but supply chain issues were happening um, in the tech area. And when you have this kind of reliable source uh, that you can go to um, for all parts of what you need done, um, then I think that was, was a really good advantage for them. So that's really it. That was a, this is a short one, and I want to thank you for listening to this. Uh, I guess case study on IEC, and we're gonna have many more of these coming. I have a nice, a really nice one coming uh, for the next one. So stay tuned for that in, in a few weeks. And if you want to basically, um, you know, learn more about geo investing and subscribe, uh, we have a free trial, a seven day free trial. We have annual, biannual, quarterly memberships. You can uh, go to geoinvesting.com. Uh, and you can see, you'll see a free, a free trial button. You can also call us anytime you want at 1-800-891-1526. The calls come right to me and I love talking about stocks. So don't, don't worry about calling me any time of the day. And uh, if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one with me uh, to talk about uh, what we do and go through our platform, I love doing that too. And we can set that up too. I have all the contact information here, how you can get to us. Uh, there's a, a, a you can go to geo and you'll, you'll there'll be a contact form there if you want to get us that way you can also email us at support at geo and um we know we're you know we're covering over 1500 stocks now uh, we've been doing this for a long time since 2007 8 and we love what we do we think we're entering into a really new bull market for um kind of value classic value investing in the buyer cap and nano cap arena and um this is right in our sweet spot and we got a lot of great um, uh, stocks in our pipeline. We'd love to have you um, check them out. We, um, not only do we have model portfolios, but we back up everything we do. Uh, we talk about with research. So I hope to talk to you soon. And I hope you enjoyed this case study.